Welcome in to the PHNX Sun Show. It is a flavoring Friday brought to you by our friends over at OG's. Special shout out to them. They are the official sponsor of Flavoring Fridays, and they are not your average cannabis-infused gummy. gummy. They absolutely knock it out of the park when it comes to flavor, and the effects of their gummies are total slam dunk, too. I'm your host, Espo. Lindsay has the day off. I'm here with Saul with Flex. And Gerald Borgay, live from Minneapolis. Gentlemen, how are you? Good evening. <laughs> Not quite evening yet. Anything after 12 o'clock is evening, isn't it? No, it's afternoon. Afternoon, no. Thus the name, after I mean, noon. it is 3.45. Yeah, evening isn't until like 5, 6 o'clock. Is that your rule? No, that's the rule. Is it? Yes. W then what is it, 3 or 4 o'clock? It's afternoon. I, I I, right say I say five's a cutoff. Yeah, five is a cutoff. Yeah, five is a cutoff. Cut Gerald, five, what do you what what do you say? In in Minneapolis, it is after five. Are you in the evening there? Yeah, I mean it's evening here, so he's good on that front, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so suck it, Espo. Uh, hey, I've had a long day. All right, I had the uh, privilege of pissing off a billionaire, so I felt like I was back in the Sarver Suns days. I spent my morning out at the Alex Morello press conference. So I heard your question. I'm saucy right now. I'm going to tell you that much. So I heard your question. <laughs> a good question. It was a question, that's for sure. <laughs> we have plenty to talk about today. We are previewing uh, the Suns Timberwolves series with stats. That's why Gerald had to be on. Uh, even though he's sitting at the University of Minnesota's practice facility right now to do this. Uh, we are going to break it all down. We have plenty of stats. Each of us provided some. You, you make me laugh. Why? You sound like you're you're doing the impression of uh, Will Ferrell and Harry Carey. Stats right now. <laughs> the Cubs are 4-1 on the season. If I were a hot dog, would I eat myself? <laughs> <laughs> Lucas says, do you hate the media also, Espo? Yeah, yes, that was a quote. Uh, yeah. Yes, I, I hate myself. Yeah, we some hate days. ourselves every day. Especially, especially when Saul says that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we also are going to get to some practice sound as well. But off the top, I kind of want to know, take a temperature check. Where's everybody feeling? We we're under 24 hours until game one. Uh, how are you sitting here? I'm good. I'm good. I'm I'm. Ready to, to watch this game tomorrow. I don't think I have any – I'm not anxious or anything like that. I'm not nervous or anything like that. That will probably kick in a little bit tomorrow, but I, I think today I'm, I'm chilling. Yeah, same. I'm pretty, pretty calm. Let's see what I did there. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty calm. I mean, I'm, I'm confident in this basketball team. I think they're uh, – I, I, I'm always a little weary when you get this much time off before a playoff series. I, I – I, I kind of feel like staying in rhythm is a, is really a thing, uh, but everybody has to get the time off. So um, we'll, we'll see, but pretty, pretty calm. Gerald, how are you feeling? Yeah, I'm excited. I'm, I, we've been talking about this matchup for almost a week now, and obviously we love the NBA playing, but the downside is that we have to wait a week for more Suns basketball. And now after getting to talk about it for so long, we're very close to being able to actually watch and, and dissect and see how these two different teams are, adjusting compared to what they did in the regular season. So I'm, I'm excited for it. Yeah, I'm excited as well. And I do like the week off. We talked about it. It gives Kevin Durant, who's played an ungodly amount of minutes this year, a chance to rest the rest of the guys who have had injury concerns uh, to kind of heal up and, and get a little bit better. So I like it. But Frank Vogel today out of practice actually talked about what it meant to have a week off before game one. Yeah, they're ready. Yeah, they're ready. They've been extremely attentive in all of our film sessions, which have been, you know, with the with the week off, have been <laughs> very thorough. Um, but they're very attentive, very locked into uh, the plan, and you know the different ways the game can shift. You know, with, uh, with potential adjustments, and um, you know, we kind of talked about all of it, and uh, and we'll, we'll be ready to, you know, for whatever they throw at us. 
Gerald, he seems pretty confident there about how his team is prepared for this, but what else did uh, Frank have to say and what was the vibe at practice today? Yeah, I mean, I, I think they, like us, are excited to actually get out there and play. They probably feel very confident about the matchup itself, but they understand that the Timberwolves are going to make adjustments, that they're going to come out with a different sense of focus. I think this is their first game one that they've hosted in a playoff series since 2004, so you know that place is going to be loud. And, and with the way that the Timberwolves have started off first quarters against the Suns, I'm sure that's a point of emphasis for them as well, since the Suns have outscored them by 40 points in those three first quarters. So. Um, I'm sure the Suns are going to be ready for that first punch. And, and this is where Frank Vogel's background, he started in the NBA as a video coordinator. I think with this week off to really dissect film and dive into what the Timberwolves might do, um, you know, the Suns feel very prepared for whatever punch they might throw. You know, I think something we kind of overlooked a little bit this week is that we've been so focused on because the Timberwolves have been the team that have lost three straight games to the Suns, what adjustments they're going to make. I'm really interested to see what Frank does um, in terms of this, these film sessions, what he thinks that Minnesota is going to do and how they're going to counteract it. Uh, you know, I think this is definitely, you know, we, we talked about Frank Vogel is supposed to be a defensive coach. I think, you know, this is a, a good opportunity for him to make sure that his team is ready for every scenario and anything that Minnesota is going to throw at him. So I, I don't think we've really talked about that too much this week, but it's kind of good to, to bring it up to the front because I think the Suns even have room to improve in terms of how they play Minnesota, especially in the second halves, even though they haven't. I think Gerald, one of Gerald's numbers we'll get to, so I won't spoil it, but um, I know that, you know, the numbers – tell a certain story and I think there is room for improvement when we get to the anything after the first quarter yeah I think this is where Frank makes his money I really do I I I think we we've been hard on Frank uh a lot this year and and rightfully so there was there was a lot of things that he he deserved to get criticized on but right now I think this is where we're going to see Frank make his money I think Frank is better suited to be in a position where he knows the opponent he can make the adjustments he can do some things in game. Um, this is this is what playoff basketball is about. So, looking forward to like you said, uh, the, both teams are going to have to make adjustments. The Suns are going to kind of have to uh, anticipate what Minnesota might do in Game One. But after Game One, a lot of that stuff goes out the window. Uh, game One is the trickiest game, and then after that, I think I think the Suns should be fine. Yeah, I think the anticipation is interesting, and how how many different defenses do you have prepared to try to stop? Uh, Anthony Edwards, if he becomes a passer more than trying to score, because in these first three matchups, he tried to continue to score. He didn't yeah. really try to connect, uh, you know, with the guys on the wings that were open. Try to get better looks for them. How do you adjust if he starts finding those guys? They start hitting their threes. What happens there? It's going to be an mm -hmm. interesting chess match. One of the places that the Suns have had success is on the offensive end of the floor. And Yusuf Nurkic talked about how important setting quality screens is to them defeating the Minnesota Timberwolves' big lineup. Been setting good screens for these guys all season long. How important is it in this particular matchup with a lot of the perimeter defenders that they have? I'm glad you noticed, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's huge. You know, they have a length, you know, what they say, they have a McDaniels. So you take for whatever you want to take from that, but um, you know, we feel confident and as far as my screens, you know, they're gonna have to deal with that whole whole series, whole playoffs as long as we play. Um, you know, I try to, you know, get my, my guys open, my teammates, get better spots and I think pretty much whole year I was doing a great job, but you know, it's zero zero, so it's almost like a preseason, so you know, but with the playoff intensity, it's a zero zero, everybody even, you know, some, some of them have home court advantage, but for us as a team, we don't really care. So we're here and, you know, we're looking for the win. I freaking love Nurk. He just threw slight shade uh, at Anthony Edwards for his uh, McDaniels comments about guarding KD, right? Wasn't that what he said? Well, he, got, said he said they, McDaniels? Yeah, he said they got – guy said they got KD. He said, yeah, we got Jaden McDaniels. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Hey, brother, good luck with that, dog. <laughs> Good luck with that. Uh, Gerald, uh, what were your kind of impressions with Nurk there? Obviously having a little fun with you guys, but pretty serious about the way he's going to approach this. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's pretty much what he's done all season in terms of setting the screens. It was kind of funny that he was like, thanks for noticing that. Um, but it is one of the parts of his game that goes under the radar. Uh, I actually wrote about this over at gophnx.com for diehards when I was breaking down how they're going to attack Rudy Gobert and Carl Anthony Towns. And part of it is freeing up the big three, Grayson Allen, with the screens that he sets. Uh, Nurkic is actually fourth in the league in screen assists per game and fifth in screen assist points generated. So he's a top five guy in both areas in terms of getting his guys open for easy looks. And that's going to be key against a team that has several all defensive candidates. Um, You know, Anthony Edwards, when he's one of the worst perimeter defenders on your team, that's a tough team to score on. The Suns haven't had problems to this point, but I think the Wolves are going to be better defensively. So Nurk being able to set those sturdy screens and give them even a little bit of breathing room coming out of the pick and roll, that's going to be huge in this matchup. It's not the only guy that talked about the dual big lineup, though, of uh, the Minnesota Timberwolves. KD had some thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I mean, just try to play together and move the ball, um, move bodies. Um, they're a big, long, athletic team, so you don't want to try them too much and try to force things at those guys. They're smart. Rudy is extremely, you know, has gotten extremely better at guarding perimeters, guarding posts, guarding the rim. So you just can't just throw them in actions expecting them to just give in. I think uh, we be, we're strategic with what we do. We make the ball move. We got get stops to get out and run too as well. So um, we've got to be cautious of putting guys in actions, but also um, realizing that they still have an all-world Hall of Fame defensive player over there and guys around him that can guard on the perimeter too. So uh, we just got to be aggressive to, to, to put our head down and try to get something going. How concerned are you guys about the the dual big lineup that that they run out there? Uh, man, I I feel like every si- single time we talk about the Timberwolves, I'm going to set myself up for failure. So <laughs> if the Suns absolutely fall on their face, uh, I'm going to eat a ton of crow and I'm going to look like an absolute dumbass. But I'm not scared. I just don't. <laughs> there's nothing about Rudy Gobert in the playoffs that has ever scared me because he's been taken advantage of far too many times. And I know he's a great defender, especially interior-wise. But, you know, we've seen when, you know, Nurk comes out of the game, they can spread out. They can go five five out and and try to take advantage of a guy like Rudy. So I, I think he's he's a great player, but I just don't – I'm not in fear of him like, like normal. And I don't really consider Cat like a dominant big man. I feel like he's just kind of a, a bigger kind of all-around player. Um, and if he hits from the perimeter offensively, that's the thing that's going to keep them afloat. But defensively, I definitely am not. Um, I'm not worried about that at all. Yeah, th- this is the most intriguing thing to me. I I don't think they have a man. I I I'll, I know, man. I feel like I'm no, about to dig myself. No, a listen. Grave. I I I respect the Minnesota Timberwolves. I think they're a really good team. They're a well coached team. They're talented. They're in this spot for a reason. You shouldn't underestimate any playoff mm-hmm. team. You got to go in there and and play basketball and move the ball. But I'm I'm gonna tell you what my opinion. Uh, Minnesota's only chance of really making this a competitive series, in my opinion, they got to go small. They, Towns, Rudy, and Nas Reed. It, it's gonna be hard, man. It's gonna be hard for those three guys to operate in this series, especially if you're putting two of them on the court at the same time. That's their bread and butter. That's what they've been getting. That's that's what they've been living with, and. Another thing about this Timberwolves team is they live and die with their defense, but they got to get ahead, man. They got to get ahead. They cannot play from behind. They're not built to play from behind. And so, man, it, it, this is intriguing because this is a matchup that I think completely benefits the Phoenix Suns top to bottom. If they do their job, um, that's the question. If they do their job, what mm-hmm. Phoenix Suns team are we going to get in game one? Um, but if they come out and do their job tomorrow – uh, this could be rough going for Minnesota. Gerald, did you get the feeling out there today that, that they kind of feel like if they take care of business, uh, they're basically they're the only people that can beat themselves uh, in this series? Not publicly. I, I think behind closed doors, they probably feel very confident about this matchup because this was my biggest takeaway writing my Die Hard article for today was they are not afraid of Rudy Gobert at all. Like, you you know, we heard from Book earlier in the week, and he was saying, yeah, he keeps that paint on lock. We really got to pull him away from the rim. But watching the film back, they were going right at him, at the rim, finishing over him. 
uh, getting past him with their change of pace, movements, hesitation, dribble, that type of thing to just freeze him long enough to dribble right past him. Like they are not afraid of him, even though he's one of the league's best rim protectors. And watching a lot of other Timberwolves film against other opponents, I haven't seen Rudy struggle quite to this degree against any opponent on the perimeter like he has against Book, like he has against Bradley Beal, um, even Grayson Allen on certain plays. Like they are going at him. They know that he's going to be in job coverage. And when he comes up, they've done a really great job of feeding the rolling man and either, you know, finishing at the rim or kicking it out to the corner for three. They've put this defense in rotation and that's without even getting to Carl Anthony Towns, who, like you said, Saul, he has to be contributing like 25 points a game on the offensive end, because otherwise I don't know if you can keep him out there. Um, And that's a problem for a Wolves team that needs as much offense as possible, especially with the way they've guarded Ant. So like those dual big lineups are going to be tough and it's hard for Minnesota because they've been so good all season being a red this was something i heard on a wolves podcast that i liked being a red and now you have to be green like can they flip that switch can they totally change the way that they play to suit this one opponent i don't know that's a tough adjustment to make with only a week to prepare the other thing too is uh, i i'm i'm kind of fascinated about first of all your comment about the other podcasts i would love to hear what some of those other you know pods are saying out in minnesota but uh, you're looking at a team like with with the Suns where you have the big three, but you have other supplemental pieces that have contributed from time to time, especially like Grayson, where he's dropped, you know, 30 plus points in the game before he's hit eight threes in the game before, you know, that potential is there. I'm looking at the Timberwolves and I feel like they have two in Ant and Cat and those two have to be on. Like they don't have the luxury of one of them being off yeah. Um, in order to win this series, those two have to be, they got to be lights out this entire series because they don't really have a backup consistent score to go to. Mike Conley is probably as close as they can get. And if you're asking for Mike Conley to save the day, uh, you're probably going to be at in Cancun next week. So mm-hmm. you have to, that, that's my thing is that my head is telling me that every single aspect of this matchup the Suns are going to own the only the only sliver of hope that I feel like the the Timberwolves have is can they muck the game up and be as physical as possible to really make it you know just uncomfortable for the Suns can they do what the Pelicans ha, ha, you know could do for a little bit in that series a couple years ago and they couldn't even beat the Suns in that series and they didn't even have Devin Booker for half that yeah. thing you know what I mean so you know how good can this Timberwolves uh, team be at, at really trying to make this game ugly. I just, I don't see it. I'm not trying to be conceited. I'm not even trying to be like a homer. I just feel like it's going to be a really difficult task for Minnesota. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, I, you know, another problem is, you nailed it, Ant and Cat have to be superhuman, I think, in this series. They got to get busy, both of them. The problem is, man, I'm not convinced Cat's ready. No, I don't think so. I, 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 I looked at that game multiple times, and it looked like the Suns clearly went out and said, we're going to make this guy go lateral. We're going to put him on an island. We're going to pick him out. We're going to hunt him. We're going to make him go lateral. We're going to make him uncomfortable. There were times where even Cat got the ball at the top of the key. Multiple times we get the ball at the top of the key with Brad Beal on him. And he just didn't look comfortable doing anything but settling for a bad shot. And so that tells me that, you know, the Cat we're dealing with is a guy that's coming off of a knee surgery a month ago. And that's a, that's a tough task. And, and to your point, I just I just don't see the other guys. They don't have a guy that mucks it up. They don't have that that irritant. Like if you play the Pelicans, you got Herb Jones, you got Jose Alvarado. They're going to muck the shit up. If you're playing against a team with a Pat Beverly, they're going to muck it up. You're playing the Clippers, Westbrook's going to muck it up. I don't see anybody on that team that's going to say, I'm going to take this guy and try to take him out of series and I'm going to muck it up to the point where I could disturb the Suns' offense. Well, they got, they got Jaden McDaniels. They got Jaden <laughs> McDaniels. My bad. My uh, bad. They got Jaden. Yesterday we heard uh, Anthony Edwards give a little bit of bulletin board material to the Suns. Uh, KD was asked about Ant, and he did not return serve. He had some quite nice things to say. Yeah, man, it's mutual respect. I always have respect for Ant's game. And, um always wonder what type of player and person he is, so I'm looking forward to seeing what that, oh, I knew what type of player he was, but the person he is and how he approaches his work, I'm looking forward to seeing that on a day-to-day. Um, always appreciate him showing me love when he came into the league, and he competes at the highest level every time he steps on the floor. There's no 
I don't feel none of that. You know, I watched you as a kid type vibe when we play on the court, you know, and I, I respect him for that. Um, but I can't wait to be around him and all the other guys. I always learn so much from being around greatness. Yeah, I mean, obviously – He's smart. He yeah, it's smart. You don't want to say anything that's going to give any motivation. But I think there is legit respect there, though, too. There is legit respect. But that last little bit, I feel like I feel like that was that might be one of the few times this season where I feel like, oh, was there a little bit of like, yeah, I can't wait to guard him kind of thing. Like, yeah. I feel like he's he, he wants that challenge and he is taking that challenge all season long. I'm just talking about verbally, like acknowledging that there is going to be a player on the other side that you feel like you really want to match up against and you want to try and shut down. And I, I know KD enjoys that challenge. And listen, I, I have no problem with Ant talking the way he's been talking. No, like, no. I, I have zero issue with it. You should be confident in yourself. You have to be confident in yourself to play at a high level. I'm cool with it. I am really looking forward to KD's defense and how he's going to match up against Ant. He's done it multiple times already in the last three matchups, and he's done very well. He's played very well, very good defense against the Timberwolves without a doubt. So, Again, that's just another challenge for the Timberwolves to try and overcome. So I, I, I think I, I'm not sure if the audio was shaky on that, but I don't think he said directly about guarding him because the, the question that I had asked was in reference to Ant in that same interview. He had said, like, Kevin Durant is my GOAT, basically. Um, so it was kind of asking about his reaction to that and his thoughts on Ant's game and, and also the fact that, you know, they're going to be playing for Team USA together. So it, I don't think there was anything to that in terms of, like, you know, shots fired or shots returned there. No, I'm yeah. not saying shots fired. I just, it, that last, like, um, that last sentence or two that he was talking about, it, at least from what I heard, he said, you know, I, I look forward to matching up against him and other and the other guys. Like, I feel no, like. I think he, he was saying being around. I think he was saying being around them. Like, team is uh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I misinterpreted yeah. that. Although they have to yeah. do, they have to defend Nike's honor since, you know, he's an Adidas guy and said book should come to Adidas. So they've got to defend his honor. Uh, before we move on, we got a super chat from BCOM. See clearly, Gerald, you can't see this, but I'll read it for you. It says, eating booty all playoffs, hashtag <laughs> Suds and Four. Uh, I would recommend some mouthwash if that's what you're going to spend all playoffs doing. Uh, so... I don't know. The man paid two hey, bucks. I'm going to read it. That's uh, what he said, man. Well, that's what he said. I mean, hey. it, it, it's not the. Let me say this. After going to that press conference today, not the worst thing I've heard said today. <laughs> all right. This is this is going to be fun, man. Listen, Ant, Ant's going to get busy, man. Ant, Ant's, Ant Edwards going to get busy, yeah. man. Well, we'll see. And we'll get into some stats that we'll talk about that shortly. But we've got something immensely important to get to. Something exciting, something new. We're dropping a new shirt oh, today. Look what? At this. If Eric knows where the graphic, there it is. Look at that. It's our it's our playoff shirt. It's Phoenix versus the world because it has felt like that all season. It feels like that going into the playoffs. Uh, it is Phoenix versus the world. If you're listening on audio, it's got a very uh, angry angry gorilla That's on what it, it. Is. Uh, when, and it says Phoenix Glass. versus the world. <laughs> Uh, he he looks like he's w rocking a pair of shoes that we might recognize. Is that the Gringo Gorilla? He's got a he's got a hairline that we might recognize as well uh, from okay. somebody here in Phoenix. So uh, <laughs> go out there, go to ch check out the uh, phnxlocker.com. dot com. You're gonna be able to pick up your shirt today. And guess what? We've got a new provider, so these are gonna ship out a lot faster. You'll be able to have them for the playoffs. Yep. Pretty dope. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty dope design, man. I really like it. I can't wait to get my hands on it. Look. Uh, Flex. Yeah, I've laid off Puerto Rico since you've been gone, because we're trying to forget what happened to Damn. you this season. It's over, right? It's over. Yeah. So we can we can forget Lay off that. PR. Okay. And that we can just talk about what lies ahead. <clears throat> yeah. And you're a baseball guy. Family, Damn. family love baseball. Yeah. Well, guess what? Our friends over at BetMGM have the Grand Slam jackpot promotion every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday throughout the play the baseball season. They've got, this is really cool. It's a weekly bet uh, and get promotion. Place a $10 wager or more on any player to hit or home run uh, every weekend day, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. If the player hits a grand slam on that day, you could win $50,000 daily or share the prize with anybody else who bet 
on a guy to hit a home run that also hit Damn. a grand slam. For example, a customer bets on Aaron Judge to hit a home run on the 31st of July against Houston. Damn, they got real specific there. If, the, if Judge hits a grand slam along with nine other customers, each of you will take home five grand in additional uh, in cash and additional to your bet winnings. So sign up for BetMGM. Use promo code PHNX. Place your first bet uh, through the Sportsbook mobile app of, for at least $10. You're going to receive up to $15,000 in bonus bets. Even if your bet loses, check out the show notes for full details. And now listen to Shane talk about the disclaimer. Bonus bets expire in seven days. One new customer offer only. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Available in the U.S. Call 877-8-HOPE-NY-467-369. New York. Call 1-800-327-5050. Massachusetts. 21 plus only. Please gamble responsibly. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP. Arizona. 1-800-BETS-OFF. Iowa. 1-800-981-0023. Puerto Rico. First bet offer for new customers only. Subject to eligibility requirements. Bonus bets are non-withdrawable. In partnership with Kansas Crossing Casino and Hotel. See BetMGM.com for terms. U.S. promotional offers not available in New York, Nevada, North Carolina, Ontario, or Puerto Rico. Get stuffed, Ontario and Puerto Rico. You are safe now. Flex is done betting. Uh, you know, Gerald, uh, I, I have some bad news. We just got called. You have no uh, press credential for tomorrow, but you can still get in the game with our friends at Game Time. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, and you can save 20 bucks real easy. Uh, download the Game Time app. Use the promo code PHNX. You're going to get $20 off your first ticket uh, purchase with Game Time. I've used them for con- concerts, for sporting events, for theater. So I don't want to hear your takes on my theater habits here. Uh, you can do that. It's it's super easy. And it's great to wait till the last minute uh, because they got great deals. Flash deals, zone deals, they got everything. Uh, so find it easy to buy and tickets for any event in your area. Lowest price, guaranteed event uh, cancellation protection they've got they've got uh, job loss protection if you lose your job you pay for tickets they'll take care of you they got so many things Damn, to really? help you out yeah really? i mean look at that they're looking out for the people right so i was like good to know espo we need I, to have a talk after I mean, today's show <laughs> i mean if you buy them if you buy them last minute though like how quick did you lose your job in between that that purchase and when right the game started? I got the ticket. Your boss says if you go to this game, you're fired. <laughs> and you buy the tickets anyways. Oh, T- take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account and use code PHNX for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms of apl- uh, terms apply. Again, create an account. Redeem the code PHNX for twenty five or twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. Uh, we got some stats that we want to go through with you that are kind of preview the series and Gerald I, I'm going to start with yours I'll read them for you don't worry you don't have to squint and try to see them off the phone there Gerald uh, first stat to consider when it comes to the Suns and Timberwolves series is this Rudy Gobert was a minus 68 in 86 minutes against the Suns this season Carl Anthony Towns was a minus 32 in 60 minutes. Gerald, why do you feel that this is such an important stat and do you think it will continue? <laughs> because that's two of their big three. And if you can't play either one of those guys in this series, this is going to be a sweep. And now I, I don't think it's going to be that drastic the way that it was in the regular season. The Timberwolves, like Book pointed out earlier this week, have found ways to defend at a top level in the NBA despite having two bigs out there. So they're they're good at figuring things out in that regard. But the Suns create all kinds of matchup problems for them. Like I mentioned earlier, they haven't been afraid of Gobert, and they've been able to play him effectively off the floor. Carl Anthony Towns, we know they're going to try to turn him into a pigeon and target him defensively. So can Cat hold up? Can he contribute enough offensively to kind of outweigh some of those flaws in his game? And with Gobert, can they use the size of having two seven-footers to punish the Suns? Because the Suns, as we know, have been undersized quite a bit at times. And as soon as Nurk either goes to the bench for his rest or gets in foul trouble, the complexion of this series changes a lot in terms of what you're able to do with that size advantage. So that's my biggest thing is, is that going to hold up? Can Gobert and Cat stay on the floor and help the Wolves actually be positives with on the court because they're getting outscored by an average of 20 to 30 every game. This series is going to be over real quick. But is it the size advantage when Nurk goes off the floor or the fact that you're turning to Drew Eubanks? And I don't mean to be rude to Drew, but we've seen him be ineffective. I wonder if you went to that smaller lineup with KD and more that death lineup, if you will, if you kept that advantage because you'd still be trying to, you know, trying to run Gobert off the floor, spreading him out and making it more difficult. When you go to Drew Eubanks, it's very much a 
watered down typical center uh, where where Nurk you get a lot of variety. This is just a guy that is a big that tries to pick and roll and dunk and isn't particularly good at it when you go up against a guy like Obear. I I prefer uh, going with Thad. Uh, that's the other that's the other aspect of this. That I think they they should have taken a little bit more advantage of. I know we saw it a little bit in the last game. I think that's something that they're going to look to exploit if Drew Eubanks is having just a you know. A, a, a rough stretch again and, and again I think that is proved that he can play and he gives you a little bit more versatility on the offensive side as well because he can pass he can drive a little bit so I think that's the the switch up uh for the Suns that you you're going to probably see the most but I agree like I I just don't see a scenario where where the Timberwolves are going to be able to take advantage as much as they would like to with their bigs especially with Rudy Gobert I'm I'm all with that, man. It, it, you know what? I, I think the Suns are baiting them into a couple things in these in these three games that I've seen on tape. And when I say baiting them in, I, I think they've done a good job of taking an early lead and and putting some pressure on Minnesota, and then kind of baiting them into going deep into the post. Because I I think I don't think this team shoots enough threes. Minnesota doesn't shoot enough threes for me. The Suns are one of the teams that we've argued all year need to shoot more threes. And if you go look at the three games, the Suns have outshot them from the three-point line in attempts. And so if you're if if you're bait, kind of baiting them into, okay, yeah, that's open. Throw that to Rudy. You're just not going to beat the Suns doing that. You're not going to beat the Suns throwing it down to Rudy, trying to get easy two-point baskets or whatever the case may be. I think you're falling into the trap. And I think that's going to be Minnesota's biggest problem. Do we fall into that trap and take that paint? Or do we try to keep up with this team that's got enough firepower to blow us out the building? I think the problem, too, and Gerald, I'd love your opinion on this since it was your stat, but it's it's not like the Timberwolves can bail out of uh, of any of their, their bigs. I mean, Nas Reed, Cat, and, and Gobert are all such a big part of what yeah. they do. I don't think it matters that they're that they're in the minus that big. They can't change it. They have to ride those guys, right? They have to, or they have to change the complexion of when they're playing them. I, I think there's something to try and cat at the five in certain stretches. I think we might see single big lineups with them, but you're right. Like they, like we said earlier in the show, they've been one thing. They played one way for most of the season. Now they have to totally change that or choose to live and die by it. And this is the one matchup that can kill them on it in terms of having four shooters out on the court. So I am interested to see how they adjust, what wrinkles they throw the Suns way, because I, I think Chris Finch and the rest of their coaching staff is well aware they can't continue to play the way that they've played against this particular opponent, um, because the matchup-wise, that's just it's a challenge for them for sure. Let's take a look at Gerald's second stat here as well. Uh, second one, the Suns have held Anthony Edwards to 43 points on 42 shots. Uh I I don't see this being something that can hold for an entire series. No, and, I, you know, and, go, ahead, go ahead. I'm just I just he's too good of a player, yeah. and at some point he'll either figure out how to, to how to navigate that defense, or the Suns will have some breakdowns where this guy has his moments. Right? Yeah, and yeah. it's gonna get busy. And it's yeah. gonna get busy. And it's gonna be incredible in this series. Believe me, that ain't going I don't think that's gonna hold up. What I will say though is, if Ant gets busy and does what he needs to do. I don't know if that helps Minnesota. I really don't. I think this is one of those series where if Ant's going 40 a game, they might be in trouble. Because if Ant's going 40 a game and they're one-dimensional, how do they get the rest of the points? Where are they getting everything else from? There's no ball movement. So I, Ant's in a tough spot. You need him to play incredible, but he has to find that in-between where he can still get his and 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 help his guys be better. That's yeah. that's what I think stars are. A superstar in the NBA is a guy that can get his and make other guys better. This is going to be one of those series where you're going to see if it can and get his and make his team better. Yeah, and I think that's that's the that's the caveat right there. I think Ant is still in his developmental stage in terms of being an elite player all around. Mm -hmm. He's a phenomenal scorer. He's a tremendous young talent. He can take over a game at will, uh, which is tremendous. But I do think in terms of getting everybody involved, keeping the pace going, uh, staying um, you know on rhythm, uh, and staying in in terms of their system, you know, staying in, in pace. I think Ant still has a little bit of of improvement to go there. So it's going to be a little you know it's, it's again for Ant. He's got to realize that like yeah, I could take over a game, 
But the only way we're going to win this series is if I play at a high level and keep everybody in mm-hmm. tune. If I can't keep everybody in tune, it's just going to be it's just going to be too, too discombobulated for the Timberwolves. I think you said it earlier. I think Mike Conley becomes a weird X factor in this series. How can he set up guys? Can he score enough? Can he help Ant take some of the pressure off of him? And if you're relying on that, we've seen how relying on an overage point guard can be problematic. Gerald, why did you pick this stat in your mind? Yeah, I, I don't think it's sustainable to that degree by any means, but it is interesting having talked with some Timberwolves media people out here about Ant. You know, when Cat went down and throughout the season, he's had to take on more ball handling, more lead initiator duties than normal. Um, and the big change for him was learning to get off the ball when he got double teamed and embracing that, which is something that's hard for younger players that are great scorers to learn. Um, it was a situation where earlier in the season he was trying to force it through double teams and, and work his own way through and score anyway. Um, and they really had to emphasize, like, get off the ball. It's going to come back to you, and you're making the people around you better. So that's my question for this series is with the way that they've defended him by showing so much help on his driving lanes, showing him a crowd, um, you know, always – kind of confronting him with that triangle shaped coverage that they throw his way. Yeah. Is he going to be able to get off the ball? Is he going to be able to make plays for other guys? And are those guys going to be able to make those shots? Because if he is getting other guys involved, if he's getting, you know, eight, nine, 10 assists and then still scoring 20 to 30, that's where things get really yeah. interesting for the Suns defense. So I, I think it is going to, I think he's obviously going to produce a lot better than he did during the regular season against Phoenix. Um, but I'm interested to see what his process is like because if he is trying to force it and if he's reacting a certain way to the physicality, this was a big part of what I wrote about uh, the Suns' defense on him earlier in the week, he can tend to get frustrated by physicality if he's not getting the whistle. So that is definitely something to keep an eye on as well. Flex, why don't you run us through your first stats here that you thought were important? Yeah, so I, I got I a good one and a bad one. Um, my first one is... The, the, we all know the Suns are almost unbeatable this season when they get 30 assists. Um, in the three games they play Minnesota this year, they're averaging 29.3 assists per game, okay? Um, that right there tells me that they're moving the ball. They're keeping those bigs in motion. Uh, they got them scrambling. They got them rotating. At the end of the day, this is the stat that I think is going. I'm going to live and die with this series. If the Suns continue to move the ball at this pace – and can just get these shots and and put that defense in a in a what's the word my my the old coach used to use my man Igor Kokoskov, uh the 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 what he says in a blender right didn't he always say that mm-hmm. you don't remember that no. all right anyway I don't remember anything Igor Kokoskov used to say we got to get him in a blender well that's what they've been the Suns have been putting Minnesota in a the blender these three games if that continues I'm sorry I don't want to be too cocky or bold but if that continues. Minnesota doesn't have a snowball shot in hell winning this series. And so we're right on that number, 30 assists a game. That's the one that stood out to me the most. I think this has more to do with the Suns yeah. than the Timberwolves. Oh, no, right? more about cut, the Suns. Cut yeah. down, make sure the turnovers do not rear their ugly head. Yeah. Keep moving the ball, don't default to ISO. Like these are, these are the fundamental tenets of how we saw the Suns win or lose all season too, right? Yes. Like if, if they can't turn into selfish ISO ball and they can't turn over the ball, that's how you get to those assist numbers. And it happened in this last game. In this last game, they had their spurts where they're moving the ball, look, looking beautiful. It looks like Minnesota has no way. And then there was two, three minute stretches where they tried to revert back to ISO and you saw what happened. So they're going to naturally do it in spurts. Tigers don't change their stripes. These guys like to be, uh, they like to be ISO players because that's who they are. But again, if that, if that trend continues, uh, man, Minnesota's in trouble, in my opinion. Gerald? Yeah, they've, they've, they've got to mix in a healthy blend of targeting mismatches without going to ISO. There you go. Because there are, there are going to be pigeons in this series that they want to get certain guys switched onto a KD or a book in certain situations, but they can't just default to that. Uh, and to your point, Flex, like the Suns are 21 and four this season when they get to 30 assists. They are 28 and 29 when they don't get to 30 assists. So that is definitely one of the big barometers for, you know, the Suns all season and probably in this series too. Yeah. 
Agree. Flex, what was your next one that you had? The next one was a negative, but I think it could be a positive too, okay? Uh, you know, the Suns have dominated the Timberwolves by almost 15 points per game in these three in these three games. Now, it's regular season. You got injuries. You got back-to-backs. We'll factor all that into it. What I don't like is that Minnesota's getting to the free throw line almost 25 times per game in these in these three games. And we saw it the other day. They got to the free throw line at an insane, uh, at an insane clip. Um, my, my thought about this is pretty simple. If the Timberwolves don't get that number, they're in trouble. I mean, they, 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 look at that. I mean, they've been they're getting they're losing games by fifteen plus, and and you know we we can all admit that the final scores of none of these games were what they actually should have been. You know, there there were games where the Suns were up thirty, high twenties. It got down that made it fifteen, but they're living and dying at the free throw line. And if that's a big number, 25 a game, if they can't get these 20, what happens if they don't, if the Suns find a way to cut that out a little bit or, or, or chip into that by five, six, seven assists again, uh, I, I just don't see how the Minnesota Timberwolves are able to weather that storm. So uh, a lot of, a lot of reason to be optimistic about this series because the way Minnesota gets busy or the way that they, you know, make their money, it just quite doesn't add up to the way the Suns do things. So this, it's just a bad matchup overall. So watch the free throw number. If the Suns can cut that out a little bit, more hell for the Timberwolves. Just don't be sloppy. Yeah. You know, Nurk yeah. got some sloppy fouls last game, and they were they were avoidable. You know, yeah. I think he's the one that I really focus on when it comes to fouls is he's got to stay on the floor, and he can't, you know, pick up his second foul, you know, within three minutes of the first quarter, and he can't pick up his third within the couple minutes of the second. Like he's got to be out there on the floor because he makes a significant difference. And so that's that's the number when it comes to fouls that I look at. And I agree. I think the the benefit is, is that the playoffs typically are a little bit more physical. They let a, a few more yeah. things go. Um, I do wonder because you know it, it kind of changed a little bit after the All Star break in terms of the physicality that was being allowed. I wonder how much more they would allow in the playoffs. So they've been pretty physical and still picked up that number. So I don't know how much room for for improvement there's going to be, but I would agree that they do need to improve that number because 25 is pretty high. Yeah. Gerald? Yeah, that that number just points to me the, the size disadvantage there that's going to be there. Sometimes they're going to get looks around the rim and you have to foul to send them to the line rather than give up an easy two. And we saw that in the third quarter last time they played when Nurk was on the bench in foul trouble and – Drew Eubanks got a bunch of fouls. Thad Young came in, and it was the same thing. I think Rudy Gobert had like seven, nine free throw attempts yeah. in that third quarter alone. So that's that's where the Timberwolves can really put their size advantage to use. Um, and it's on the Suns to make sure that they are rotating defensively and uh, hopefully chip into that number by a couple of attempts, like you said, Flex. Yeah. Gerald, I believe you had a third stat, too, that we'll get to here Real quick, uh, Suns were plus 40 against the Wolves in the first quarter, but were only plus seven in the other three quarters combined. Uh, is this a little deceiving, though? Because towards the end of these games, we did see a lot of bench matchups, yeah. which makes me wonder how much is that? But that's, that is concerning because what it says, obviously, is Suns need to get out to a fast start. Uh, because that's been the recipe against the Wolves and, and Flex, I believe you said it. This team isn't built to play from behind. So, Gerald, what was your read when you looked at that? Yeah, I mean, you look at the Timberwolves' point differential by quarter, and the first quarter is by far their worst. They tend to get better as the game goes along. There's a pretty drastic difference between their third and fourth quarters compared to their first and second quarters. So I think the Suns do need to continue to get off to fast starts and put them in a hole because that's where – you know, the Wolves have started to grow familiar with this matchup. You want to keep them familiar with that. Um, and don't even put the whole Suns fourth quarter thing to the test. I, I think yeah. that thing has been a little overblown, as I wrote about. They haven't blown a double digit or a big lead heading into the fourth in, in months now. Um, but you do want to get off to a fast start against this team. And I think to your point, that stat is a little bit overblown because the game was out of hand in the first quarter and like, almost all of those matchups, it was easier to kind of let off and the Timberwolves try to chip their way back into the game. Um, but to your point, like the second and third quarters, you want to continue to lay it on them. You want to build on your lead if you can. And if you do find yourself in a dogfight, I'm fascinated to see how they respond to that. 
Agree. Sorry, I'm just so distracted by the super chat. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I, you know, back in the day when when the, when the NBA had hand checking, it was more of a defensive game in the playoffs. You know, there was this phrase that people used to say. You know, I don't watch it. The game doesn't start until the last five minutes. Like I, I remember growing up hearing that a lot. Don't even watch the first start of the game. Watch the last five minutes. That's all that matters. This is the complete opposite. I think a lot of these games are going to be determined in the first five minutes. I think, you know, if the Suns can come out in the first five minutes of basketball games and just do what they do, put them on their heels, uh, Minnesota could be in trouble. So I, I'm going to be looking at the very start of every game this series. And I'm, I go on a limb and say, you know, if they start fast, they're going to win. If, if Minnesota is able to stay within distance for the first six minutes, you might be in a dogfight. It may be that simple. Agreed. Uh, look, we got a couple more super chats, and it's pretty clear <laughs> that Bcom C clearly is partaking wonderfully in flavoring Fridays. I think he's had a few of our uh, OGs <laughs> over there. Uh, the first one is: Does Zach Allen remind anybody of Brandon Webb? Wrong show. They'll be on later tonight. <laughs> and then the next one is: I'm in love with Devin Booker. I don't care if he's single. He's my man. So watch what you guys say about my man. Heart emoji. Heart emoji, heart emoji. <laughs> Would anybody like to respond to B Com C clearly? Nah, man. Oh, yeah. Do what you want with your man. Yeah. I think we found the Redditor from earlier this year. <laughs> Do what you want with your man. That's my man. All right. Hey. However you feel, Robert. <laughs> but, hey, Gerald, you may be out of town, but I just want you to know from the bottom of my heart, you're still in my inner circle. All right. Uh, and, you know, but if you want to be in an inner circle, Circle K has you covered. Uh, just download the Circle K app and you can sign up to become a member of their inner circle. It's going to save you 25 cents per gallon on your first five Phillips. And boy, do you need it right now as gas prices are moving back up. But don't worry. It's not just your first five Phillips. After that, you're going to save three cents per gallon every day. And you're going to hit a certain level. I like to call it the ESPO level. And you can get five cents off per gallon. But it, that's not all. This free membership is also going to get you your sixth free on a selection of Circle K products, including pizza, coffee, and ice cold fountain drinks. America's Thirst Stop has got you covered. That's right. So join the inner circle for free by downloading Circle K's app today. Terms and conditions apply at participating locations. Visit CircleK.com for details uh yesterday i joked that we needed to uh open a lot of desert financial credit union checking accounts uh, i think it was 10 million for us to get to that 2 billion mark or, or, uh i didn't really mean it guys but i do want you to go over <laughs> that's just uh, you know in case the feds are watching i didn't really mean it <laughs> Uh, but, but I do want you to go sign up for Desert Financial Credit Union. And when you do, you're going to get $200 in bonuses. Super easy. Uh, for more than 84 years, Desert Financial has been Arizona's largest and most trusted local credit union dedicated to creating exceptional experiences by giving back to the community and providing financial solutions that make lives better. The Desert Financial team are financial experts who are committed to their members and the community offering financial solutions tailored to help real people achieve their financial goals and dreams. Look to Desert Financial for checking and savings accounts, mortgages, loans, credit cards, investment options, and so much more. Join a credit union that's committed to giving back to the community and sharing success with its, me with its members. When you open a free checking account online, get $200 in bonuses. Get started by visiting desertfinancial.com slash 200. Saul, you got a couple of stats that you want to share. Why don't we hop into your first one? Here? Why not? Let's talk about Cat, huh? <laughs> so Cat is shooting 12.5% from three in two games against the Suns. He's one for eight. He shot 41.6% from three in total this season. So if you look at that number and you look at somebody who's going to have to help Ant out, uh, that's the first place you got to start because Cat is the other guy that uh, you know can score easier than everybody else, and he's a good scorer. He could shoot the ball, but obviously the meniscus and coming back from that E injury is something to definitely watch for. And if they play mm -hmm. him off the court offensively, then the the Timberwolves are are just going to have such a predicament on their hands. So I'm looking for Cat to be a little bit more aggressive. I think this week off 
will also help him mm -hmm. um, just get a little bit more confident in that knee, feeling a little bit better with that knee, getting more treatment on that knee. So I, I don't think we're going to see the same cat as we saw the first two games. And even in that first game, he was one for four, but he still scored over 30 points, and he had a really all, good all-around game. He was really the only one in Minnesota that did anything worth talking about. So he's definitely a, a threat, but we've seen cat in the playoffs before, and he's had a tough time of it, and he still – you know, if you go back to this last game, he he still struggles on the perimeter against really good offensive players that are quicker. So, I don't know what to expect from Cat. If they have, if they want to survive, Cat's got to play at a high level and keep shooting that forty percent clip from three. You're you're a guy who went through meniscus injury, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. How much early on did that impact you getting back into a shooting rhythm? I know we're not NBA athletes, but there is some some universal truths. Was yeah. it? Did it take a little while for you to find a rhythm? Coming off that injury, obviously it impacts the lateral movement. But. It, it does impact lateral movement, especially lateral movement. Because, especially, yeah. Because I remember um, before, like when I, when I damaged my meniscus, I didn't realize it damaged my meniscus, and I went to play basketball again, and all I did was make a V-cut. And mm -hmm. when I made the V-cut, I swear, I felt like my leg just slipped. Um, and I fell on the ground. I held my knee. I thought I tore my ACL again. Um, and, and so it, it, it takes a little bit to to get that confidence back. He had a different surgery than um, Damian Lee did. Uh, you know, obviously it, it wasn't nearly as severe. But again, you got to get that confidence. And that lateral movement is the first thing that you're going to think about when you're when you're dealing with a meniscus. It's yeah. not forward movement. The forward movement and the stop and go stuff is all basically ACL and quad related. It's not meniscus related. When you go side to side. That's when you start to think about it. That's when you feel it the most. And if and if and if he feels like he's confident in that knee, he should be a better player. And I feel like he will be a better player coming up on tomorrow. But uh, yeah, it's it, it'll fuck with your head for a little while. I I'll, I'll tell you what, um, it it really fucks with your head. It really does, especially laterally. Um, I don't I don't think it really relates to shooting though. No, well, I think it's, well, I'll, I think no it's more defensively. Okay, well, yeah, I'm yeah. I, I'm actually going the shooting aspect of it is interesting. Um, if there's nobody in front of you, it has not, it's not going to affect your shooting at all. Yeah. Here's the thing from my experience in dealing with my son who shattered his knee in two years of recovery from all this stuff. Um, when you get a guy defending you on the perimeter and he's smaller and he gets into your legs, this is what I saw on tape the other day with Brad Beal. This is the point I was trying to make. The sons were switching off guards. And, and they're getting under his legs. And he's not, you can tell he's not confident enough to make that move without having that peak to the ground. Where's my foot landing? Where am I going? Where's this guy at? And so in most cases, it doesn't affect shooting. But in the way the sun seemed to be shifting and defending him, I, I definitely think it's in his head. I, I think he's uncomfortable with guys that are getting under him that seem to be smaller. I think he prefer bigger guys. If you put a big guy on him, he's probably going to be more comfortable. Gerald, do you think he's going to see some of these struggles continue at least early on in the series? I'm, I'm honestly not sure. It's hard to tell with a player that's coming off an injury and has only had a couple of games back. I think that definitely doesn't help his case. But to our point earlier about Cat, and, you know, whether his offense can keep him on the court, I think the three-point shooting is a really good measure for that because when you we talk about the Suns' tight shell defense against Anthony Edwards, part of that is covering back out the shooters as quick as you can. And Cat at seven feet is one of the hardest guys to do that with. I think they did a good job in the last matchup. But if Cat is able to get open looks and knock them down better than he has in the prior two games against the Suns, that changes the complexion. That could force your defense to open up a little bit more and give Ant more driving lanes as you adjust to a player who's knocking down shots. So that's going to be huge for the Wolves. They need Cat to be able to hit that three ball the way that he has all season instead of the way he has against the Suns because if he can't open up the floor, like Flex said, they don't take enough threes. I think they're bottom five in the NBA in three-point attempts even though they're third in three-point efficiency. So – they're a team that can hit threes, but they've got to take a lot of them. Cat's a guy that does, and if he's not hitting, the spacing is going to be really tough for them. Yeah, again, you're talking about the overall game, right? The uh, the all around game. You know, Cat's uh, gravity. If he's hitting that three, opens it up for other players. Um, it opens up for guys like Ant, and especially guys like Mike Conley. Uh, whether it be driving to the basket or from the perimeter. And Mike Conley's the next stat that I have. 
um, when we're talking about his his performances against the Suns, Mike Conley is averaging 2.6 assists per game against Phoenix, less than half of his season average. He averages six on the season. Um, so against Phoenix, he has not been able to distribute uh, and put guys, uh, set up guys in position to score uh, at a higher clip. Um, and because of that, everything else, again, there's no lanes to pass when everything is compacted in the middle. And so Conley's kind of struggling when it comes to that. And everybody keeps – Every, everybody's looking for that third guy. Who's that third guy? To me, it's going to be Conley, at least on the offensive side. And if he can't get it going, I, I just the, the Timberwolves are just really going to struggle. Yeah, I, I'm glad. Go I ahead. just I'd be interested in seeing. And forgive me, I didn't look this up, but I'd be interested in seeing on average during the season how many assists Conley has to Anthony Edwards because yeah. with Edwards having a much lower scoring average against the Suns. How much is that impacting him uh, as well? Yeah, th- that could lead to the ball sticking a little bit, like Conley's uh, dip in assists. I, th- this is another thing about this Wolves team, and Gerald just pointed out. They're bottom of the league in three-point attempts, okay? Um, they're also not good in the mid-range. They're just not good in the mid-range. <laughs> like... I, I'm I'm trying to I've been I've been spending a lot of time trying to figure out one how Minnesota got through this regular season with the success they got what, what they had and I I think it was Stat Moose I'm looking at it but you know he put up a list of mid range buckets for the season I don't know if y'all saw this um, Kevin Durant and Devin Booker have 435 mid range buckets combined okay? combined. Just KD. This wasn't even the Suns. This is just KD and Book. Okay? For, did you see this, G? 435, 435 mid-range buckets. The next team in the league is 410 to Thunder. It goes on as to a, show as a as team. A team. <laughs> Kevin Durant and Devin Booker have more mid-range buckets than the entire Thunder team. They're number two at 410. Pacers and Pistons, 398. But I say this to say... They list every damn team on this list, and the the Wolves are damn near dead last at 264 as a team. So I'm sitting here and I'm saying they don't shoot enough threes. They don't shoot enough mid-range. And their defense doesn't seem to be able to have an answer for the Suns. Where the hell are they getting their offense from in this series? They're going to have to shoot more threes. I mean, it, it, shoot it, seems, a lot more threes. it seems just that simple. They're going to have to do that if they want to compete. We talked about it all year. Threes worth more than two. It's it's a dumb phrase, but it's it's logical. And the Suns at times weren't shooting enough threes. And we yeah. came, our argument was that's the path to victory. Well, that feels like the only way the Wolves are going to be able to compete here. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're going to have to find ways to contribute outside of Anthony Edwards. They need to get Conley pick and rolls going with Gobert and some stuff at the rim. They need to get Cat involved. They need to get, you know, open shots for Nikhil Alexander-Walker and Jaden McDaniels in the corners. They need to get even Kyle Anderson, if he's able to stay on the court, they need to get him some shots because he has an advantage as a guy that's a little bit taller. But um, it's tough to see them doing that. And to your point about Conley, like he just, it doesn't feel like he's been involved partially because they've been so focused on trying to get Ant going against what they're doing defensively. They're going to need a much more well-rounded attack in this series. Eric, let's go to my first uh, one here. We'll go through mine quick. Uh, so for me, Minnesota scored just 102.7 points per 100 possessions in the three losses of the Suns. That was five points below the league's worst regular season offense. Now, to me, I look at this and I go, okay, so Suns' defense was elite. When you go into these games, you think Minnesota, number one defense, you know, they're, they're going to win by defense. But the Suns have played unbelievably elite defense in these three games. I don't know that they can do that throughout a whole series. That's my concern uh, in, in the way that they looked so dominant in this. But can their defense really hold Minnesota to five points lower than than the well, league average? I, I think so. And the ah. reason why I say that is not based on the first game. It's really because of Bradley Beal's impact on the game um, in, in the backcourt. I think he's been able to really 
take the Suns' defense to another level because of his energy and his defensive acumen. Um, and everybody else has kind of picked up their level. KD's been playing at an elite defensive level basically all season long. He's taken up assignments and he's played one-on-one at a high level. He's done a great job. They needed other people to contribute. And I think when you have another guy – being able to step up like Bradley Beal, you saw him get his hands on like it felt like every other ball in mm-hmm. the last game on Sunday. Um, th- that just means a lot. It gets guys into the game. They know that they're close to getting a steal. They they know they're close to getting out to the uh, on a fast break, which led to the you know uh, Gerald had another number where it was um, the Suns uh, turnovers points off of turnovers almost double. Right, when they're playing the Minnesota Timberwolves, um, and, and the Timberwolves actually decrease. Uh, in terms of points off of turnovers because of just the frenetic pace that the Suns are trying to play at. And it, it just plays into the Suns' hands. So I, that's yeah. what I feel like. Watching that game on Sunday made me feel even more confident that the Suns are going to dominate this series because I feel like they are starting to get locked in defensively. And Minnesota, because of their lack of really athleticism at every angle, uh, it, it, they seem like they're a little bit easier of a team for a team like the Suns to play. That's okay. why the OKC Thunder yeah. were going to be such a difficult proposition for the Suns because they're younger, they're more athletic, they're a little quicker, um, and that that can cause a little bit of issue for the Suns. So, again, I just think that this is a perfect matchup for the so, Suns. So I, I think it could stick. I, I really do. And and back to the point that you just made, um, the Suns are built. I, I just feel like they're built to defend and operate versus teams like Minnesota that are front court dominant. And I think the flaw was this, this summer, I think the Suns built this team to beat the Nuggets. I think they, or they, they, the the entire architect of this basketball team was to beat the Nuggets. Well, the Minnesota Timberwolves fall into a little bit of the dynamic as far as roster construction that uh, Denver falls into. The Suns don't match up well against the Thunder. They don't match up well against the Mavericks. They don't match up well against the Clippers. Those are all teams in the top five of that stat I just read, right? The mid-range. So teams that can beat you from three and attack you equally in the mid-range, perimeter teams, Suns are going to have trouble. I hate to say this. I don't want to sound disrespectful. And I believe me, I respect the Minnesota Timberwolves. But watching the film, man, they're easy to defend. There's not too much complex co- complexity to this team. I I watch it and I'm like, yo, this is this team – just does not give the Suns fits defensively. They just seem like a very easy team for the Suns to handle defensively, which is why I think that number could stick, Espo. I, I, just my opinion. I, I don't know. What you think, G? I don't think it'll be that severe, but I do think the Suns, like they're, I think they're a top five half-court defense since mm-hmm. the start of February to the end of the season. They've been really good in that respect. And the Timberwolves aren't a team that wants to push the pace. I think they're 29th in fast-break points. So as long as the Suns are avoiding those types of stupid, careless live ball turnovers that lead to easy points, I think the Timberwolves will struggle in the half court, especially if Carl Anthony Towns is still kind of shaking off the rust there. Like the Wolves were the number 17 offense in the NBA this season. Uh, And part of that is because Cat missed a month, but you know, even with him out there, they weren't like an elite offense. So I, I, and I, even if they were, I don't think you're getting that version of Cat at this point that we saw back in November. So right. uh, this this is a tough one, and I think the Suns, they could be peaking at the right time defensively. I don't think they're going to bottle up Anthony Edwards that way for a whole series. I think there will be games where a guy like a McDaniels or a Kyle Anderson or somebody off the bench hurts you a little bit. Um, but I, I think they have a good chance of really making this a defensive series for sure. All right, do me a favor. Hit that like button if you're in here. Uh... Make sure to do that. I also want to read a few super chats here. Go to tech reviews says cat is empty calories. Yeah. I, I, I think that's kind of been the knock on him for, for a lot of his career and our friend <laughs> be calm. See clearly is back sponsored oh. by OGs. I always wonder what Devin Booker smells like. <laughs> I like for real, not trolling. I had a dream. Me and Devin got married back in 2023 after the playoff exit. Heart emoji. Oh, man. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We got that going for us. Let's go. You know, you know what? B <laughs> cop speak clearly makes me want to drink. <laughs> All right. Man. And you know where I can do that? With our friends over at Four Peaks. I think I'm going to head over to that A Street pub. I'm going to have a couple Wow Wheats. <laughs> uh, I'm going to have a beach ale. <laughs> maybe, maybe one of their vanilla bean uh, porters there. Uh, because this is just. 
very weird today. yeah but our friends over at four peaks never make it weird it's always a good time uh and right now they've got plenty going on including a coyotes event on wednesday uh which is supporting youth hockey in the valley so go to our website check it out you can buy a ticket uh to support uh, the kachinas the youth hockey organization in town or you can donate on that link as well it'll be out at the four peaks uh a street pub on wednesday april 24th at 7 p.m you can join us there and while you're there uh, you can have a bad birdie juicy golden ale a collab between four peaks and bad birdie it's super drinkable and the perfect companion at the tea box or in the fridge. So visit fourpeaks.com slash locator to find all your favorite beers and events. Check out at Four Peaks Brew or at Four Peaks Pub to keep up with the latest at Arizona's hometown brewery. Must be 21 or older to drink Four Peaks and please enjoy responsibly. And you know what? Today has been in many ways sponsored by our friends at 4G, 4G, OGs. I got a, I got a text from Eric oh, right geez. in the media. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. oh, in the me- middle of that, uh, our friends over at OGs, uh, they've launched two new products made with live rosin and ROS. The OGs Naturals and the Big OGs. The OGs Naturals are vegan gummies made with live rosin, available in a sweet clementine flavor. Meanwhile, the Big OGs gummy is a mega virgin. This uh, mega virgin and a mega virgin. virgin. (laughs) I saw you. Wow. (laughs) You've got a kid. That's not true. Uh, Derek Montia, our our resident resident, uh, 420 expert, is in the house. I'm just here for the libel. He's just like Beetlejuice, but for OG. (laughs) 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 Did somebody say gummy? Are you going to Buds of Blues tonight? Let's go. Absolutely. Nice. I mean, that's what I suppose bearing the lead on this man it's, hey, it's, it's all about butts of palooza hey, tonight hey, get Darren. out there get, is it true juice. is it true you you took a hundred milligram gummy bro <laughs> all at once he ate the big uh, the big ogs once is that true no comment okay <laughs> all right. All right. we don't recommend you, you that's, eat that's the big whole OGs all at once <laughs> they come in 10 slices for a reason and the 10 milligrams of thc in each so for a total of 100 milligrams so check them out to learn more about og's gummies and where you can find them head on over to ogsbrands.com must be 21 or over to enjoy and please enjoy responsibly out at buds of blues at night uh guys to wrap it up here i want to get us on the record we've talked we've kind of hinted about how we feel but i need to know who you're taking how many games Saul, I'm gonna put you on the spot first here Everything in my soul is telling me is telling me this thing is not going more than five games. I also don't want to be that guy, so I'll say Suns in five. Flex. Oh man, I'm very I'm very confident in this basketball team. Uh, I like this matchup. I'm gonna be a little bit more humble though. <laughs> no, I, I am. I, I because I, so I am six. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm honestly listen. I truly believe this series can be wrapped up in five, like Saul said. But the heckling jo- uh, Je- the Hyde. Jekyll and Hyde of this basketball team. Jekyll and Jide. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that part of this basketball team gives me a little apprehension. So I, I'm going to say Suns in six. They wrap it up here, game six in the Valley. I will say this. In my opinion, if the Suns get to a six game, I think they lose the series. I don't, I don't, I don't think if they get to a sixth or a seventh game that they win this series because they they are far too dominant of a team over the Timberwolves to fuck around and get to a sixth game. In my opinion, that means something has gone wrong. They are not playing at their peak, or they're the inconsistent Suns that we saw earlier in the year. If they get to a sixth game, I do not, I do not like what's happening. Okay, Gerald, are you allowed to make a prediction? Am I allowed to ask you that? <laughs> yeah, you can make, you can ask me that, uh, Gerald. What's go, your prediction? Uh, uh, I'm going Suns and six on this one. I, I think the Suns have a lot of advantages that are just ultimately going to be too much for Minnesota to, to overcome. But I do think we're going to see a much different Minnesota team, especially in game one. Uh, they realize they've been down big early in every single game. They realize the importance of sending a message to the Suns and not falling into the same hole. Um, and I think they're going to have a game where Cat goes off or where someone from the bench makes a huge impact there. 
Ant's not going to get bottled up for that whole series. And this is a legit Minnesota defense. Like, they're they're going to be better, I think, than what we've seen. But I do think some of the inherent advantages that Phoenix has are going to come to light at some point. So I've got Suns in six. I want to say Suns in five. I want to say Suns in six. But I think this is going to go seven games. Damn. Okay. Oh, look. We're cooked. Are we're you cooked, serious? y'all. Look, we're Minnesota. cooked. Minnesota. So we're winning game seven My in Minnesota? God. Yes. Seven games? Yeah. Oh, because, yeah. on, look, now. Minnesota was in the number one seed for a lot of this season for a reason. The three games that we've seen against against the Suns, I'm worried are putting us all in a false sense of security with this team. I think Cat finds his three-point stroke. I think Anthony Edwards finds a way to be the guy that we've seen all year. I also think there's one or two games where the Suns will shoot themselves in the foot because we've seen it far too many times this season. I think this is a series that very easily, if thing a couple things go the Suns' way, could be done in five, maybe six. But I just everything I've seen this this year, it's done the hard way with this team, and I feel like Minnesota is going to find some answers along the way. But the Suns will inevitably win due to having more talent. It'll just come in a game you, seven. You think? You think? Okay, I got. I mean, let's let's talk about this for a second because I can't. I I can't. Mm-hmm. Um, so you think that if the Suns get to a game seven? I, clearly, that means Cat and Anthony Edwards have been playing out of their fucking minds too, like carrying the torch, doing everything they need to do. That the Suns can go into Minnesota at that point and still beat Ant and and Cat if they're playing as outrageous as it would take to get to a game seven. Yeah, because no way. Okay, in the high Zero pressure chance. situation, I'm going to take Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, and Bradley Beal over Ant and Cat. And Rudy Gobert, and I think that if you get to that point, then that's that's why you brought the, the, these three stars in because yeah. at, when it counts the most, that's when they're supposed to step up, and they have more talent. This is a team that does have more talent than Minnesota, but I refuse to believe that Minnesota is just going to roll over uh, and play the same way we've seen in all three of these games. They were one of the top teams in the West for a reason, and the Suns have flaws we've seen it all year we've seen where they could go up 2-0 in this series and and think they have it in the bag and not come out with the intensity that they need we've seen this team find ways to lose when we thought it wasn't possible uh, yeah. throughout this season so that's why i'm not i'm not feeling as confident that this is is some simple series or a dog walk uh, you know as, as you like to put it i just i think that there's, it's as much about the flaws we've seen the Suns have along the way as it is about about the Timberwolves. But if it comes down to one game, take it all. Who's got the better talent? Who shows up? I'm gonna take the team with uh, with Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, and Bradley Beal because those are stars. But, follow- but, but but the problem is is that we're not talking about a one game take it all. You gotta consider the last six games that led up to that one game take it all. And if you're giving the Timberwolves that much confidence at that point, I do believe. Listen, I do believe the Timberwolves are not shook by the Suns, but I know that they're concerned about the Suns, very concerned about the Suns, and they should be. And I think your points are relevant about their inconsistency all season long. I completely agree. However, comma, the only team in the league, in my opinion, that they have not had those issues with at all in any way, shape, or form is this Minnesota Timberwolves team three times in a row. Yeah. Even in, back in November, in March, in April, it hasn't mattered. They've dominated them in every asset of the game or facet of the game, and there hasn't been anything that the Timberwolves have been consistently able to go to to take advantage, even though there's 29 or 28 other teams in the league that have found something to take advantage so, of. So that's why I'm like, eh, you genuinely I don't, I don't feel so. confident that they're going to, in totality, go seven and one against this team this year. Because if they win in five, that means they went seven and one against this team. A million percent. The, the odds in terms of the way the Suns have played this season and th- that team showing up at some point or f- multiple games is pretty damn high. The fact that it didn't happen in the three games against Minnesota are great, but I just refuse to believe that one of the top three teams in the West, a team that was at the top for as, as long as they were in this season, is just going to roll over and lose seven uh, out of eight to this team in totality right. this year. So, okay, you want to put some money on it? Here's the thing. Oh, I don't <laughs> want to steal your <laughs> money. You want to bench some, uh, you want to you take some lunch, a uh, lunch bed or something like that? We can't afford that song. No, I, right, I'm so, fine. So <laughs> here's, the, here's the thing, Espo, 
I, I listen, dude. That's your prediction, and you have the. I mean, your points were you have the right to feel that. way. No, no, no. Your point. <laughs> you you got valid points to well, feel the way you feel. I'm. I'm. This is where I'm going to go with this. I I struggled between five and six. I've been thinking about this for a couple of days. I'm going to say this. I think the Suns win the series. I I don't think it goes seven. And I think if it goes seven, um. It did. They're, they're reverting that, back to the you old. You can hit stuff. that oh shit button. If they right, go to seven. but but his. I'm I'm. A, this is my prediction. I'm going to say this right here. If the Suns win Game One, this shit is done in five. Yeah. I think yep. it depends on how. No, no, no. no. no this, this is my prediction. Yeah. <laughs> just no, like Saul could tell me I'm wrong, I'm just telling you what I no, think no, about no, no, it. No, 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 you're right. No, I'm, I'm just saying. It I, was just my prediction that Saul told me I was an effing moron. No, this. no, 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 no. I, I, no, I'm saying this is just how I feel. I, I think if they win game one, it's over in five. I think if they lose game one, Suns win in six. You know why I said... The Suns in Gee, is seven. that fair? I, I said Suns at seven because anytime I show irrational confidence or say something, Gerald uh, Gerald tries to hide out of out of the screen view, right? And then Gerald's so large on the screen, I didn't want to make him feel awkward today. Listen, so you got them, you got you, them winning he's in seven, right? You. No, look, For no, his yeah, he's I think they win in seven. As as win six, okay. six may, I can totally see six, but I feel like seven is just the way this season's gone. Okay, and and and, and that's. That's just the way I, I feel that. about no, it. I get right? that. I get that. Gerald, any final thoughts? You know, do you think I'm an idiot too? No, I, I don't. I, I think it's tough because the Suns match up so well with this team that it we would like to think it should be Suns in five or something like that. But I do think the Wolves are gonna try different things. They're gonna be better than what we've seen in the regular season. They were too good of a team during the regular season to just completely crumble. And I will say the last time that I was this confident about a Suns matchup was Dallas back in 2022. <laughs> and we know how that went. This is a little bit different because I think you can point to specific matchup problems that the Suns create against the Timberwolves, against the Mavs. It was just like, yeah, we just own them. We've kicked their ass. It wasn't like anything stylistically. And we know that styles can make fights in the playoffs. So I do think it'll be Suns in six, but I think the Wolves will have one or two games where they look more like the 56 win team that they've been rather than, you know, the team that's been stomped by the Suns three straight times. Yeah. Look, I, I, I hope that. I'm wrong. I see that. Hey, he brings up the Mavs. That's probably part of it because you talk about it not being, you know, isolated games, but game six, the Suns kicked the Mavs in the teeth and game seven, the Mavs didn't seem to remember that the, that the Suns had owned them. Uh, a few nights uh, earlier, the Mavericks five, won though. game. No, no, Mavericks no excuse won me. Game, 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 five. Five. It was game five. five yeah, game five. That the Suns kicked them in the teeth in and game, game six. Six they and came seven. Out. Yeah, yeah game like six it didn't. Seven. It didn't impact them that the Suns beat the crap no, out of them in game. No five. disrespect to Anthony Edwards though, but he ain't Luka Doncic. No, he ain't no like, not, definitely not in the passing they, game or they, any other. They certainly don't have the outside shooters that Dallas had that that season. We're talking about a team that can't really shoot from the yeah. perimeter as, as I, well as a lot of the teams that have given the Suns problems this year. Again, like the numbers just don't feel like they and, add up. You know, it's so another, I go back to that Maverick series and, and I, I will say this too. Uh, nobody gave Jalen Brunson, nobody gave Jalen Brunson enough credit in that series. He, he was really good in that series. And I think he showed a little bit of who he's becoming now. So in that series, it was all about Luca and this guy, Jalen Brunson, who seems to be good, but mate, we don't know what he is. And now you know what Jalen Brunson is. So that team was a little bit more equipped than, than people would have given credit for back then. I, I hope anyway, I, I hope I'm wrong. Yeah. I want, I'd love to see five. I hope you're right. Oh, from that I, standpoint. I can see so, seven. That's I, I I'm want with it. you. So, I can see it. We got a few more super chats. Thank God they're not what we read earlier. Uh, Go to tech review says I'd feel confident if it weren't uh, for the Mav series. I think we all feel uh, some of us feel a little PTSD from that. Uh, True tactic says one thing that feels scary is we got Royce, E.G. Drew versus Nas, N A W. Uh, Kyle Anderson plus other vets. Now, how much or uh, how much will those bench minutes hurt us? I think that's a valid a valid point. If their bench can can find a rhythm and ours doesn't, that's going to make it tough. You're going to have to play Book and Beal and and KD significant minutes to make up for that. It's and, playoff and, time. No, I yeah. get it. They're going to play forty plus. They're going to play. Anyway. 40 I get it. Anyway. But if you're having to play them forty six, forty seven. 
uh, in some of these early games, yeah. does it hurt you in the back end because you've put extra miles and, and yeah, what does we'll, it cost? We'll see that. You know? Yeah, we'll see. Because that. We, we've seen this bench can go completely MIA for this team for large, large swaths of time. Yeah. You know? I will not be as confident um, against any other team in the playoffs <laughs> outside of this team. No, I, I agree I with just, that. I just, I, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'll I'll watch the game tomorrow. I'm like, oh, that's what they're gonna do. Okay, I have that wrong. Okay, I can see the I can see the path. Um, but I'll I'll wait to to really feel super confident after yeah. tomorrow's game because I feel like I'm going to. And if they win game one, you will see it on our post game okay. show tomorrow live from Chicken and Pickle around three o'clock ish. Three o'clock ish. The That's post game. game. Oh, you scared me. <laughs> I'm like, damn, the game started at three. I thought it was twelve thirty. <laughs> no, last thing I'm gonna say about this. Uh, don't trip out if the Suns don't win tomorrow. The world's not ending. Saul's it's game one of the be. playoffs. The Suns <laughs> lost game one last year to the Clippers and then racked off four straight. So if the Suns do not win tomorrow, please don't come in here like the world is ending oh, and man, the sky is falling. <laughs> okay? That's all oh, I got. Th- that is Flex. You can follow him at Flex from Jersey. You can follow Saul at Saul underscore Bookman. You can follow Gerald at Gerald Bourget. We'll get you out of here so you can eat dinner, Gerald. I know it's late there. You can follow the show at PHNX underscore. Gerald Suns. does not look happy. No, he's he's hangry right, right now. now. Over an hour. He, you can follow me at Espo. <laughs> and remember, sometimes you're called an idiot, but in the end, you just come out looking right. Ahoy, hoy. <laughs> We all silly like the mayor. 